stage Tom Calloway, who also goes by Spot, with those of us that are lucky enough to call him friend. I get a hunch that everyone in here calls him Spot. <laughs> Spot's part of an open source standards and marketing team. Today, he's going to show us how to embrace our weird. Let's all remember to have fun while we build community. Thank you, Chris. All right, so I'm, I'm running this on Linux, and there are bugs, and so <laughs> bear with me. Uh, so uh, I am a principal open source strategist for Amazon Web Services. That doesn't really impact any of the material I'm talking about today, um, except that I have worked in this space for a really long time. I've been doing open source for about 25 years now. Um, one of the things I want to talk about first is this idea around what open source is at a fundamental level. Um, open source is community. And communities are when people come together to do a thing or to share an experience or to solve a problem. There's lots of reasons that communities come together. but a lot of people think about open source and they think about code. They think about lines of code. They think about Git repos. They think about these sorts of things. And that's part of open source, but it's not the part I'm talking about here today. So if you were hoping to get an exposition on the best way to optimize your Git flow, sorry. <laughs> what I am, I am talking about is the community aspect of open source. It is the people coming together. Um, I like to say that communities are made of people. Open source is made of people. You know, it is that connection between people that makes open source work. And when that connection is lost or that connection becomes tenuous or people leave, the community goes away. It does not matter how good the code is. That project is not going to be resilient, sustainable, long lived if there's not people involved in that space. So I don't want to get into the soil and green aspect of that. I'm not, I'm not really trying to go down that path and, and talk about it in that way. And if that reference is too dated for you, just Google it later. It will horrify you. I'm sorry. Uh, but I do want to start with a set of foundational materials to sort of lay this out before I start talking about the fun stuff. Uh, this is my four easy steps, patent pending, on growing community. Uh, the first thing you want to do is you want to create an environment where people want to be. Saying, hey, we're going to have a community meeting down at the dump probably isn't going to inspire a lot of people to show up for that. Um, this is true in the online setting. This is true in the real world. You want to have that space where the people want to be there for a reason. There's a shared goal. There's a shared vision. There's an opportunity for them to connect, to work together. Um, you want to do things to encourage people to visibly participate in this community so that other people will see, hey, there's stuff happening over there. That's really interesting. I want to go be part of that. And then you want to promote the actions of your community to other people. Hey, check out this stuff we're doing. It's really cool. You all should come and help us. You should participate. You should use these things that we make. And then you want to invest in your community members so that they stay in your community. Because if people come once and they never come again, then you haven't really built a community. You've built something weird that doesn't last. And there will be people who will come. There will be people who will stay. There will be people who will do this across a whole spectrum. But you want to be consciously investing back into your community to do things so that the people who found it interesting enough to come once, twice, three times engage, that they stick around, they start to do more, they start to level up inside the community, they start to become deeply engaged, and then the whole cycle sort of continues on itself. You're creating a better environment where more people want to be, you're encouraging people to visibly participate, you're able to show that that work is happening, and then those people stay. And that's how communities become sustainable. Yes, I know, it seems like I've just sort of really summarized something that's super easy, right? <laughs> Good news, I'm not answering any of those questions, this is not that talk. <laughs> I want to split here and talk about me instead because it's way more fun to do that. Uh, these are some of the things that I like to do. I like to solve puzzles. I like to make puzzles. I like to build Lego, same sort of thing. I like to play games, all sorts of games, video games, board games, role-playing games, paper games. I love pinball. Pinball is that sweet spot between digital and analog for me where I can still take it apart and see moving pieces, but it's also got programming in it. It's also got code in it. It's also got electricity in it. It's really cool. It's very visceral for me. 
I like things that are secret. I like knowing things that are secret that other people don't know. And then I like telling other people about the secrets that I found out about. <laughs> and I like to make people laugh because I have found that laughter is an incredibly powerful tool in connecting with other humans that you don't know. If I can make you strangers who have come into this room laugh with me or at me, either one is works, you probably think better of me. You probably think, hey, that guy's interesting. Maybe that guy has something I want to hear about. Maybe there's something in this madness that he's spitting forth in this tiny little room. It's a powerful thing. It's fun. I know that everyone is not the same. That you probably saw some of the things that I talked about and you could say, hey, I like that. And you'd be like, no, pinball, not my thing. Absolutely not, not my thing. But I have found that a lot of people have overlap with the things that I love and they love them too. And it becomes that connection point. It becomes an opportunity for us to bond at a level. It's a lot harder to then go online and say, Spot is the worst human I have ever known and you should not listen to any of the things he says when you found out we had a common interest. I'm not saying it's impossible. I know there's at least one of you who will go do this. <laughs> but in general, when you know something about someone else and you share a common interest or you have a common experience that was a positive one, you're a lot less likely to flame that person. You're a lot more likely to give them the time of day in a discussion where it might get heated, it might get complicated. There are differences of opinion because we are not all the same, but if we have commonalities, we're a lot more likely to work together to get to a place where we can compromise or we can get to a good end result. DevConf is something that I started looking into a long time ago. I was the Fedora engineering manager at Red Hat for a very long time. And that job became kind of a catch-all because there wasn't a community manager in a real sense. There was a leader in Fedora, but there wasn't a community manager. And the leader was mostly setting direction for the project. And the engineering manager was then told to go build community. <laughs> I knew how to build infrastructure, but I wasn't really good at building community. So I immediately started looking at what other projects that were successful in the space we're doing. And DevConf was one that I looked at to get inspiration from. And one of the things that I really liked of what that DevConf was doing was they were, and I don't think they're still doing this, which is a little disappointing, but at the time they were carving off a full day in the DevConf week schedule that had no programming in it whatsoever. It was just an opportunity for their community to come together and do fun stuff. And it wasn't just an empty day either. It wasn't just like fun stuff day, go do fun stuff. It was scheduled, it was structured, and it wasn't a requirement that you do this. It was just, hey, this is what we're going to do on this day of this conference, is we're going to go out and we're gonna take a boat ride, or we're gonna do a scavenger hunt, or we're gonna do something fun in the town that we find ourselves in for this conference that most of us have never been to before. I, I went and looked, and it, it didn't happen in 24, so I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I wanna, I wanna, I did not wanna hold them up and be like, you must do this forever. Uh, but it was really interesting to me at the time and I really liked it. And I thought there's something to that. That doesn't make Debian better from a technical sense, but it might make that community better. It might make those people's connection to each other tighter. And that will make Debian better from a technical sense in the long term. Because most people like fun things. I know this is radical. You've come for all the really hot, spicy takes in my talk. Um, fun matters. Like instinctually to the vast majority of humans, we will choose the fun option over the hard option, the, the, the tedious option, and if it's a valid choice. I would much rather play a video game than do my taxes. Now, I do my taxes. I, I'm just for the record, I do my taxes. But if my taxes were more fun, I'd be a lot more likely to do them quicker. And there's aspects of gamification that come into this, but I'm not really talking about gamification. And I'll sort of get into that in a bit, I promise. But this fundamental concept that people like fun things, but if you go to, you go to technical events, a lot of times there's not a lot of fun involved in these technical events. There's a lot of sessions on the best way to optimize your YAML or 
the proper way to rustify your application stack or any number of other things that you get into. And they're, they're useful and they're the reason that you came to the conference, but they're not fun. But what if we did the sort of thing that DebConf did and we include intention logic into our spaces to create opportunities for these communities to become a little stickier. And I don't mean that in a dirty sense, let's be clear. I'm not, that's not where I'm taking this, I promise. There's children in here, I'm sorry. But it's to have those relationships between the community members be more personal, be more direct, so that there's opportunities for them to see each other as people and not just avatars, not just numbers in a system. Having fun together grows communities in a way that not a lot of other things do. I mean, if you're giving out free money, that will probably grow a community even more effectively than having fun. And people would probably lump that into having a lot of fun. So if you have money that you want to spend on this, I'd be happy to help you experiment on that problem. But really, this is, this is the thing that people tell me when I talk to people who have been in long-term open source communities for years and years and years, and I ask them, why do you stay? And the number one reason that they give me is it's I have these relationships with these people. I like these people. I like to spend time with these people. I would go do weird things with these people, even if it wasn't something that I was interested in, because I like those people and I like having fun with those people. So if we go back to our four easy steps, what does it mean when we add fun into the mix of our four easy steps? Creating an environment where people want to be, well, if it's a fun environment, if there are fun engagements in this space, okay, now I'm a lot more interested in being in that space. Now, I want to be clear, this is not where we try to pretend that the dirty, nasty, ugly work that is necessary for these projects to succeed is fun. We don't all show up and say, hey, you know what would be really fun? If we all went out and shoveled dirt. Yes, the dirt needs to be shoveled. Yes, the debugs need to be triaged. Yes, we do need to figure out why it keeps crashing when I try to do the presentation mode and I don't get my speaker notes and I'm having to wing a whole bunch of this. But we're not trying to say, <laughs> we're not trying to say that that's fun. We're not being like, hey, that's really fun. You'd all have a really good time doing these terrible tasks. That's not what I'm saying here. There are some projects that try this that are like, you know what would be really fun? Sniffing traffic, no. Okay, I am talking about actual, legitimate, honest to goodness fun, including it in your community. All right, fun in this step. Encouraging people to visibly participate in the community. Well, if you're doing a fun thing, people are a lot more likely to be willing to be seen doing it. Now, it depends on the fun thing. There's, there's some wiggle in this. But generally, if you're, if you're creating opportunities for fun and people are having fun, they become a lot less self-conscious about what they're doing. I'll talk about this in more detail in a bit. Promoting the activities of your community to others. Two websites, two communities. One of them shows people at keyboard. One of them shows people squirting each other with water guns. One embodies fun. The other embodies tediousness. They're both necessary. They're both parts of the community. But if you are able to promote fun as an aspect of your community to others, okay, I want to know why they're having fun. That, those people look like they're having a good time. I want to learn more. I want to dive deeper into that. This is a known concept in marketing. I'm a terrible marketer. But this is a known concept in marketing where when you show pictures of people having fun, People are a lot more likely to stay engaged in what's happening. That's why every time you see an advertisement for a prescription drug, there's always people going, <laughs> I'm playing tennis. You know, and then, and then on the text on the bottom, it's like this medicine may cause you to grow a tail. And, <laughs> but you're promoting the actions of your community through fun. And if you have that fun in it, it's a lot easier to do that. And then investing in your community members so they stay, I mean, this is a straight line. If you're creating opportunities for these community members to, to have fun with each other, that's an investment in making your community sticky, congealed, jello. All right, so this is my secret plan. I'm going to share it with you all. 
take pictures. It is not raccoon infestation. <laughs> I'm deeply sorry that it is not raccoon infestation. You're not ready for that plan. So the first idea that I had when I was thinking about doing this was badges. Um, and this is where I learned about gamification as a concept. Fedora built a server called badges.fedoraproject.org, which you can see here. It's still running, it's still up. We had built a message bus for all of the infrastructure that was running Fedora, all the build tools, all the build infrastructure. Anytime anyone did anything in Fedora, it sent a message across the bus and we knew about it. And we did this for data gathering so that we could see trends and behavior. And what I immediately decided was I wanted to give people achievements for the things they had done. I did not want them to have to go and hunt it down. I wanted it to just happen. So we took the Mozilla Open Badges standard and we built an open source toolkit around it and we built this infrastructure up so that people just started getting badges. And then we put out, we made a couple of example ones for big ones we knew we wanted to do that were obvious in the system. And then we immediately made a call out to our community and we said, hey, what other badges should we add? And boy, did they respond. They started to say, well, I want a badge for this. I've been doing this over in the corner and no one has noticed it. I want a badge for that. Okay, cool. We'll make a badge for that. We got our creative aspect of the community. And we said, hey, would you be willing to draw some art for this, for these badges? Sure. We'll make art. Was it the best art ever? No. But it was art and it was cool. And people could earn these little badges. And then people were like, well, I want to know how I rate against other people. And I was like, okay. So we made a leaderboard. So now we have a leaderboard. We've got a weekly leaderboard. We've got an all-time leaderboard. And then people started getting really competitive. And they were like, hey, you have that badge. How'd you get that badge? I want to know how to get that badge. And then people started doing the sort of things that come with gamification. We started creating new badges for enabling people to try new things. We said, hey, it would be really helpful if people would do a lot more testing of these updates we're shipping out. We'll give badges for that. We'll give you an opportunity to do something. And again, but the weird thing that came out of this was that these were the badges that I foresaw, and they didn't end up being the most popular of the category of badges. The most popular category of badges was I went to an event and I saw Fedora. And I had no idea initially how we were going to do that other than plug everyone into the message bus at all times. And I was informed by Red Hat Legal that I was not allowed to do that. So we came up with a fallback which was that we were going to create a system where we could generate a QR code that would generate a specific link that when you scanned that, it would take you to authenticate into Fedora and it would give you the badge for having joined that event. And yes, we knew that would be trivial to game and we didn't care. We knew people were going to post that on IRC or on Reddit or on any number of other places. And that didn't matter. We weren't concerned about that. The concern was that we felt that it was important that the people who had this opportunity to be with Fedora in a space could get a badge. People love that badge. People will come by our booth who have nothing to do with Fedora just to be like, I need to get another Fedora badge. I'm going to scan your code. Some of those people started to participate in Fedora over time. It took a while. They had to come and scan a couple of our badges to do it. But they did end up saying, you keep doing this. You keep having this be a fun little secret that's at your booth all the time. And we want to know more about you. We want to know more about why you would do this thing. Now, I learned a couple of things from doing badges. This is a still from a very famous black and white film, which includes the line, we don't need no stinking badges. And there were some people who subscribed to that philosophy, who were entirely disinterested in these badges that were being generated on the back end. And there were some people that were actively like, I don't want to ever get a badge. Even if it's automatic, even if I don't see it, I don't want that. So we went in and we built that so that you didn't have to get badges. If you wanted to opt out of it, you absolutely could. A little weird, but if you don't like it, hey, it's all good. We don't do it. Um, but most of the people in our community were either in the, yeah, I got a badge, all right, or were really excited about badges. Our leaderboard still is this contentious thing where every time a new badge is introduced into Fedora, people rush to try to go and get it so that they can bump up on the leaderboard. Uh, and not just me, although I admit that I have that problem for a while. <laughs> there are lots of things that I wish we could have done on that project. We worked on it for about three years with dedicated investment. It's still running. It's not actively being developed. It's mostly just hanging around and people add new badges to it from time to time. 
But I had some really cool ideas. Like I had like badge series where if you've got all these badges in a series, you get a special badge for that, like going meta with them. I wanted to have it so that people could have the opportunity to maybe get a certain number of badges and then get a token that they could get something physical for that badge back, like a sticker for one of their badges that they liked. Or maybe we would get, if you hit a certain threshold, that it would unlock the capacity for you to get physical swag from the community. If you'd earned N number badges, don't care what they are, you get a shirt, you get a hat, you get a car, whatever it is, the budget allowed. <laughs> yeah, Red Hat didn't have that kind of money. They didn't have car money. They had Hot Wheels money. But, um, but you know, it was the opportunity to sort of take that to the next step. So if you're motivated and you want to take those ideas, again, none of those are patent pending. You can have them all. Another Fedora idea, and this one is one that I, I didn't, I claim no credit for this one. This one sort of happened. And I'm told this is a thing that happens at a lot of conferences that sort of got brought into Fedora, but it's this idea of a candy swap where people who are coming in from a lot of different places and a lot of different communities were bringing like a tasty treat, a candy, something that was unique to their part of the world from their home. Does your place make a particularly pungent cheese? Does your place make really good jerky? Do you have a chocolate factory that's in your hometown? Are you bringing something unique from it? People like to be able to share something that's unique to their culture, to their space, to their identity, back with other people. And it's so fun. It's really cool. Some of these things, not my taste. But trying them, hey, I am better for it. Even if I now know that I do not like Norwegian licorice. <laughs> I now know this. Yeah, I know. That's always very polarizing. Like half the room is like, Okay, so the way that usually breaks down is about 40% of the room is like, oh, 40% of the room is like, you are a sinner because that is the best thing that has ever happened. And then 10% of the room is like, there's a Norwegian licorice? So if you don't know, decide whether you're brave enough to try. But what they do is they, ha they have these meetings. It's, it's a scheduled part of Fedora conferences where there's a candy swap and they promote it in advance and they say, hey, bring your, your treats. Share, bring enough to share. Everybody gets to have a turn going around and sharing. And even people who don't bring anything are allowed to participate in this. It is one of the most anticipated, most respected engagements. If we were to cut it out of the schedule, there would be rioting. They would cut tech talks out before we were to get to cut the cannons off out. Another idea that Fedora adopted was PowerPoint karaoke. If you are unfamiliar with the idea of PowerPoint karaoke, there's a lot of different names. I like PowerPoint karaoke for it because I think it accurately reflects what it is. Basically what we do is we get a whole bunch of random presentations off the internet. And then you go up on stage, not having seen this presentation before ever, and you are given a time limit in which you present with that set of material. Now I wanna be clear, you do not present that set of material. You present with that set of material. What you do is up to you. If you want to be boring, you can present upon the life cycle of the platypus as documented in those slides, or you can riff and improv off of these slides and have fun with it. And it takes a certain sort of person and a lot of people are like, oh, I would never do that. And then they see somebody do it. And then they see somebody else do it. And then they go, you know what? I think I could do that. And they go up there and they do it and they kill it. And it's so fun and Everyone is laughing and it is absurdist and weird. And you, and the, the more time you invest in finding really surreal and random presentations off the internet, the better it is. But the videos of some of these people doing these sorts of things is incredible. And people are just loving it. And they come up, they're like, I got to get a plan for next year. They don't put that much effort into their talks. Now, a lot of these things that I'm talking about happened mostly pre-COVID. When COVID happened, you know, the world kind of went away for a while. And we were all in our houses in our own little bubbles. And the opportunity to do PowerPoint karaoke and to do these things in person and candy swaps, they all went away. And we didn't want our community to go away with it. And so one of the things that we built was this idea of nest. Our old conference was called Flock. We flocked together and we were going to nest together. And so we built software for Nest that allowed us to still have fun as part of that engagement. So we built this web app, open source. It's still out there. You can find it. Um, and basically, we built this 8-bit sort of weird multi-room world, sort of Legend of Zelda top-down for the Nintendo-style look and feel 
where we built these rooms that reflected some of the things that we thought were key to Fedora's culture, its community. And we made it so that if two of the little avatars would walk near each other, it would bring up a little chat bubble where they could chat with each other. And then if the third person walked into that, they could join the chat bubble. And if enough people joined into it, it actually brought up a big blue button session. If they all joined in a video conference with each other and people loved that. And it didn't, it didn't, it wasn't too hard because we mostly just took advantage of existing open source technologies and a little bit of creativity in that. And then one of the rooms actually would connect you to Minecraft. And we had a Minecraft server that was running the whole time and people were going in and spending huge amount of times building these creations in Minecraft to share with the Fedora community. And it worked. It was the framework that we built around for all of our sessions for Nest. It was a very simple little piece of tooling. It was buggy as hell. It crashed a lot. But people loved it. And it was, that, it was that idea of we're going to build something and it's not going to be just this boring thing where you go in and watch a video and leave comments and go away. We're going to have it be fun. We're going to have that fun engagement that's part of this. Now, I left Red Hat four years ago. And I came over to AWS. And one of the things I immediately said I wanted to do is I had this idea that had been stewing in the back of my mind for a really long time. And I said, I want to go do something weird. And my boss at the time was like, well, we did hire you for this. I guess we should let you do weird things. <laughs> and I wanted to do a challenge coin. Now, if you're not familiar with the concept of a challenge coin, that's cool. Not a lot of people are. It's a military thing, historically, where when you were in a group or you did something together or you had a shared experience, there's a lot of reasons where a challenge coin comes into play. You had a coin made for that. And then you would give the coin out to the people in the group. And it would become this thing where if you saw someone from that group later and you knew that they had that coin, you could challenge them to show the coin. And if they couldn't, then they had to buy the drink. And if they could, then you had to buy the drink. Now, I wanted to take some of the hazing out of this because I didn't want to bring that into open source. But I love the idea of this secret swag, of this challenge coin that's just a thing that if you knew about it and you have the right incantation that you get one. So I made one and I didn't brand it AWS and I didn't brand it with any open source project. I just used some imagery that resonates with us all. The idea of the dumpster fire, because anyone who's worked in open source for any longer than five minutes knows this is a core part of our community <laughs> in so many ways and so many aspects. And this is, this is done with love. This is not to hate because on the other side is all of us wearing the firefighter outfit to go put out the dumpster fire. And around the ring of the coin, it says the strongest steel is forged in the fire of a dumpster. And I had these coins made and they're about this big and pretty chonky little fellas. And I then posted on social media that I was going to be at KubeCon. And if you came and found me and you either told me an open source story, didn't have to be a good one, just had to be a story, or you gave me something cool, cool was in quotes, in trade, I would give you one of these coins. And I went to a centralized point and I sat and I waited. And I waited. And I waited. And I waited and I waited and I waited and I waited. And about two and a half hours went by and nobody came. And I was about ready to be like, well, that didn't work. And then somebody showed up. And they came over and they were like, are you coin guy? <laughs> And I had to be careful how I answered that because I was like, no, this isn't the Web3 session. That's over there. But, <laughs> but I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm giving away the coins. You know, do you have a story for me? And he's like, are you for real? And I was like, that's not a story, but yes. And he goes, okay. So he sat down and he told me his open source story and I gave him a coin. And he just looked at it and he goes, that's it? I said, that's it. That's all I'm doing. I'm just giving out this coin. Thought it would be fun. Thought you'd like it. He's like, I don't need to buy anything or demo anything or I was like nope just putting this out in the universe oh cool goes away five minutes later comes back with three of his friends hey they got open source stories too hey this is going somewhere people like this people are on board with this for the next 12 conferences I was coin guy people would see me checking into the hotel Oh, shit, it's Coin Guy with the blue hair. Sorry, I'll watch my language. I couldn't not 
people were coming up to me in like weird places. Like I would be out to dinner with colleagues and they'd be like, oh, hey, um, excuse me. Sorry. You got coins. People liked it. Word got around that, that, hey, this was just a cool thing. I got a lot of really interesting stuff in trade from people who didn't want to tell me a story, who weren't willing to do that, but wanted a coin really badly and would go and make me some. Like people knitted me little things. People 3D printed me things. People bought things they thought were cool off the internet so that they would have something cool enough to give me for a coin. I have this weird little collection on my desk of these things that people have given me that were cool. And these were not people I knew. I, I like, like, yes, there were some people that I knew that, that found me and got coins, but the vast majority of the people that ended up with a coin were not people that I knew. And they were in communities that I had never been engaged with at all. And all of a sudden, all these communities had this common thread of, we all saw the value in this coin. We all started to know each other. They shared it on social media. Other people would be like, you got a coin too? I got my coin. I keep it on my desk. It started building this network of connections, and it was all around this silly little fun coin. And it cost a lot less than I thought it was going to for something that's that big. So I said, all right, let's keep going. Let's level this up. Let's do this in a bigger way. So I said, I have always wanted to do an epic scavenger hunt at a conference. And so I went to Libby, hi Libby. And I said, Libby, I want to do something really weird. <laughs> and, and to Libby's credit, she's used to me by now. And I think Libby's policy on this is we should just let Spot do what he wants and hope it doesn't hurt anybody. <laughs> I respect and appreciate that. Um, and so for all things open, uh, I made a scavenger. hunt, And a typical scavenger hunt has you to go find a thing. And I sort of built it around the conference where I reached out to all the vendors that I thought might be willing to play with us. And a number of them were. And we created a structure where you could go around to different booths and you could either ask them a question or scan a QR code or in some of the more playful ones, say a code phrase and they would respond. Uh, my favorite was the Alma Linux people. If you went to their booth and you said, summon the demon cat, they made a great show of pulling a Halloween decoration that I had bought for them of this ghost cat. <laughs> and then you had to take a picture with them and the ghost cat, and then they would put it away, and that was how you got credit for having visited Alma. And it was all this sorts of stuff, but it was also things that you could do that were fun. Like, we had a list of dances that you could do at our booth. We had a list of, you could sing karaoke in our booth. You picked the song, we'd cue it up, you sang... Doesn't have to be any song, can be any song you want, as long as it doesn't violate code of conduct. We were very clear about that. Um, but it was just fun little silly things. And then I made people go and get things that I wanted, like my favorite snacks, <laughs> like a Lego piece, like just random stuff that I was like, if you get this, you get this many points. And I weighted them, you know, the harder stuff to get got you more points, the, the easier stuff was less points. And then we just, we, we bought an app because you can because I could not find an open source app and I did not have the time to build one, but if you want to build one, you'd be my hero. And we deployed it. We had a prize that the top three people, the top five, I think we did, um, got a prize. And there was Lego sets that you got as a prize. There was like uh, some camping stuff. We had a camping theme for the booth that year, um, gift cards to REI. And we started doing it. And then, you know, it really didn't, it, I was a little worried in the beginning because no one was really, doing it people would see it and they'd be like yeah that's stupid and they kind of kept going and i was like maybe i've shot too big maybe i'm too weird and then my weird people showed up <laughs> and i remember that there was there was a couple of girls that came over to the booth and they were like you're just doing like a like a crazy scavenger hunt and i was like yeah and i was like for prizes and they were like yeah we're into that and they were like so how do we give you the stuff? And I was like, well, you know, it's two days long. I'll be here two days. Anyone point in the window. This is the beginning. This is the end. This is when we do the things. They're like, all right, all right. So they go off. They come back. They're like, we got all the points from all the booths. We're ready to do the dances. And I was like, all right, let's get this going. So we queue up the music. I had YouTube videos for all the specific dances. They're doing the Macarena. They're doing the Pee Wee Herman dance. On the show floor. This is happening. All the other booths are like, what is going on <laughs> at the AWS booth? Because the Pee Wee Herman music is going. Rah, 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 rah. And there's people that are desperately trying to do the Pee Wee Herman dance in rhythm with each other. And 
there's a, but they, but what would happen is, is one of the people in this group would know one of the dances. They'd be like, oh, I've seen that on TikTok. I know how to do that. They would teach each other the dance and then they would do it. And again, we weren't judging them on the quality of the dance. It was just the act of, of doing the thing and having fun and being silly. And people started to show up and they were like, what is you, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? What are you doing it for? Oh, we're doing the scavenger hunt. It's really fun. You can do it here. You get the app, get going. Day one ends. We have maybe 50, 60 people that are doing the scavenger hunt. There's maybe, I don't know, 500, 600 people we interacted with. 10%, best guess, are playing our scavenger hunt at this point. I think that's what we're going to get. And it's going to end there. We'll probably have to restart it tomorrow and maybe we'll get a little bit more. And so I show up the next day. I show up early and security is like your scavenger hunt. <laughs> and he goes they're waiting for you <laughs> and i come in and about 30 people are in a line with bags they went shopping they went hunting i had some really absurd stuff that i put in there because i did not think anyone would go find a kiddie pool <laughs> I was very wrong. <laughs> These people were definitely my weird people and they were just loving this. Like glow in the dark thing. Like they, one of the items was a like, glow in the dark thing. People had like bought like a whole tube of light sticks that you'd snap and they just dumped them out. They're like, here's that. Here's that. Here's a weird rock. Here's a picture of a lizard. Here's a picture of me in a playground. And they're just like, just put, I'm like, stop, stop, stop. One at a time. So I had to set up a system where I was like, check, 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 giving all these people points, manually checking them in. And then other people were like, what is going on at the AWS booth? And then they were like, can we still play? And I was like, yes, but they got a pretty big lead. People were like, I'm not going to keep going. By the end of the time, we had like a crowd of people and there were, and there were people, it was clear at the end that there was going to be a top seven. But which of them were going to be in the top five was unclear. And at one point, there was one of the girls who had started in the very beginning. And I saw that she had something in her hand. And she's standing like this. And I said, do you have an item? She goes, <laughs> and I said, do you want to go ahead and score it? She goes, she goes, I'm waiting to see if I need to use it. <laughs> she did. And she won. <laughs> we gave the prizes out. We finished it off. Everybody clears out except for the winner, and she stayed around, and, and I talked to her, and she said, you know, this was my first open source event. This was my first tech conference. I almost didn't come. I didn't know what to expect. I had no idea if I was going to find anyone that would even talk to me, that would respect me, that would... I didn't know if this was my people. And then I found your scavenger hunt, and I thought, I can do this. I don't have to know anything about tech to do this. I can just do this and maybe I'll meet some other people. And she did. She connected with a huge number of people across communities, across industries, across spaces. They all friended each other. They're all connected on LinkedIn. And she said, I now know there's a place for me here. And that just melted me. I was just like, holy. <laughs> I was just trying to be weird. <laughs> but it worked. And it created that bond of community in that one instance. So when I took it to as far as I was thinking I could go with the weird and it worked, maybe it didn't work for everybody. Maybe there was a whole bunch of people that walked by that and said, hey, that's not for me. That wasn't my thing. But for her, it was life-changing. And for all those people who played, they all have been messaging me asking if we're going to do it again this year. How are you going to one-up that? How are you going to find weirder things for us to go get? We're ready. Thought about it. That's why I don't have speaker notes. I'm, I'm winging it. My last big idea is this idea of safe space karaoke. Um, I am a bad singer. No one wants to hear it. But I like to do it. And most of the time I do it in my car or in the shower or in places where I can only torture my children. But 
I wanted to do something where I brought people together in a safe, controlled environment and said, we are going to have fun and we are going to be silly and we're going to, we're going to accept that none of us can sing and we're going to have fun with it. And so I created this concept of AWS Open Source and Friends Karaoke. And when we would go to a conference, I would find a local karaoke place that did private room, not public. I'm not trying to shame. I don't want to be embarrassed in front of people in a random bar. I know my friends don't want that. I know strangers generally don't want that. If that is your thing, love it. It ain't mine. So we find a place of private room karaoke and I set up a couple of ground rules. I say, all right, we will not be sharing what happens in here on social media. <laughs> I want people to feel comfortable, to be a little weird, to be a little wild, to have fun with it. We are not gonna shame anybody. There is no requirement that you sing. If you just want to hang out and laugh and, and smile and listen to the madness, that is a valid choice. You are not required to drink either. Yes, there will be drinking because some people, myself included, require that to accomplish these feats. But you don't have to. If you don't wanna drink, it's not a requirement. There's no pushing of it on anyone. It is absolutely up to you. And it's not a public event. It's an invite only event. It is controlled, it is contained. It is something where one of the people who has gone to this before can vouch for you and knows that you're not going to be the sort of person that's going to ignore the rules and make it a bad scene. This is not us posting openly on the internet that everyone can come and participate in this. It's not meant to be a click. It is just meant to be moderated. And so I acted as the initial moderator. Hey, do I know you? Does someone I know know you? Can they vouch for you? Are you going to be cool? Are you going to be able to follow these rules? Jennifer's like, no. <laughs> we created this thing and we said, hey, we're doing these things. We'll show up. We'll do this karaoke if you want to have fun and sing with us. And a lot of people were like, oh, God, Spot, that's a step too far. <laughs> <laughs> You've finally done it. You've finally gone too weird. I'm not. I'm not. Okay, maybe maybe I'll just go and listen. Okay, maybe I'll just maybe I'll just sit. And I want to give credit where credit is due. This karaoke idea has been in the back of my brain for years, thanks to a good good friend of mine named Jenna Likens, who convinced me that a group of computer science educators would be willing to go do karaoke with me. I said, "There's no way they'll do that." She was right. I was wrong. So I figured if computer science educators, who are generally not the most wild and crazy bunch <laughs> would be willing to do this, then our people would probably be willing to do this too. And I was right for the most part. And again, some of the people we invited were like, yeah, we're not gonna do that. But a lot of people did come and a lot of people did participate and a lot of people had a really good time at these sorts of engagements. And it crossed communities. People who I only knew from getting coins, who I had built these networking with on other spaces, people who were friends of a friend who said, hey, this person would love to do that. They'd love to participate in this. I learned that it built these relationships across communities. And when we started having to deal with shared challenges, when we started having to deal with things that were impacting open source in bigger ways, we had a network of people that we didn't have before because of things like the scavenger hunt, because of things like the coin, because of things like karaoke it made our broader community stickier. People know that I do this karaoke. Now you know that I do this karaoke. <laughs> and they come up to me and they say, hey, any way I can get on the invite? I've never done, but I'd love to. Can I come tonight? Can I join? And if we have space, I always say yes. So this is my open invite to you all. If you really wanna do karaoke with me and you see me at a conference, I stand out. <laughs> if we have space, and you don't cause trouble and you follow my rules, yeah, you can come. I have lots of wild ideas I have unrealized. I'm not going to tell them. <laughs> <laughs> All those pictures have attributions, Creative Commons licensed. The karaoke machines that I discussed are probably running proprietary software. I'm deeply sorry. The app we used for the scavenger hunt proprietary software. Sorry. I'm a bad person. <laughs> but the spirit of all of this open source community fun and being intentional about it, not waiting for the fun to happen in the corner, but saying the fun is part of our community. It is part 
of what we do. Thank you. Okay. So what are you doing for this conference? Are you going to be coin guy or karaoke guy at Punchbowl? Or? I do not have any coins. The coins are, have long gone. I'm working on a second run, but I haven't had. I don't have them yet. I do have pins in the shape of the coin. If you come by and find me tomorrow, I will hook you up. Same deal as the coin. A story or something cool. I was actually about to say I've been a part of improv groups and uh, I've been part of improv groups um, and I've, I've wanted to do that karaoke presentation for a while but I've never done it. So yeah, I mean, if you wanted to do that tomorrow, I could either go lead it or participate in it tomorrow it, or one of these days. It usually involves a pretty significant amount of prep, more than you'd think, to get the great slides that people will be able to go with because, you know... If it's my third grade book report, that's really fun. If it's a tax analysis of the grain market in Indonesia, uh, it's a little bit more challenging. So you kind of have to seed that for success. But yeah, if, if you wanted to put that together, I'd be happy to help. Are you writing a book of stories that people told you at the conference? <laughs> it's a great idea, but I don't have permission from people to do that. Uh, Maybe maybe I'll start doing that, asking for for luck for rights. Some of them, I, some of them I did write down um, with permission, but most of the early stories were just let me tell you about the time I <laughs> built my first GitHub repo. And <laughs> again, they vary in quality, they vary in depth, but they're all authentic. Like uh, the magic snake, it looked like that actually took a decent amount of engineering effort to do that. Did you have to like? Go to the company and convince them that it was worth this investment, or were you able to lift all that from Mozilla or something else? You know, Mozilla wrote the protocol, which was half the battle, and we built the message bus anyway, which was 95% of what we needed was this things are happening and messages are being erupted. And so basically, we built a, a really simple rules engine that just said when this criteria is met, when you see this traffic happen, you know enough times for this user award badge. And then we just had a list of rules. And so when we created a badge, it was just adding a set of rules criteria that was listening for incoming traffic. And yeah, again, it had bugs. There were lots of times people were like, I can't figure out how to get this badge. And we'd be like, oh, the message of us is broken. Um, but uh, it, it, I don't want to undersell the amount of technical work that went into some of the corner cases, but the message bus and the protocol were already done for us. And so once we had that in place. So was that like volunteers or was it like, I need to borrow some engineering resources from a different I was the Fedora engineering manager. And so I retasked some of my people onto this project. <laughs> <laughs> I abuse power. It's what I do. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Yes. And, yep. And you did kind of go through a number of the types of engineering projects. I guess like this sort of engineering question, but like there's always sort of this element of you wanting to not be a part of it and, and a layer of not and like you never want these people to have feelings for engineering projects. Absolutely. Just for like being aware of Yes. So one of the things that we set up when we were building badges is we'd never, all of our badges were for positive things. You don't get badges for negative things. If builds, you, we didn't want to, we didn't want to amplify negatives. We didn't want to encourage people to go out and do things that were going to cause harm to the community on a technical level, on a social level. And so all of our badges are positive. Even when things go wrong, we sell it, we spin it as a positive. You know, you learn by failing. So when your builds fail, that's not a bad thing. We don't want to go out and have people make builds fail, but builds are going to fail. And so we, we have the build fail badge, which the panda is a little bit confused in the picture on it. Um, and so when, you're, when your first build fails, you got the, the, the badge that says, keep trying. <laughs> you're going to get it. And then when you get the 50, 50 packages failed, panda is even more confused. <laughs> but it's still the series of badges the panda is, is getting 
getting better. The panda is getting more experience. And ultimately you get to the end. And I think we ended up calling that one something like the Hindenburg or something, just because we were like, okay, this is the one exception we're going to make. We're really just going to be like, okay, you, you, maybe you should stop building packages now. <laughs> but it was all done in fun and it was all done in spirit. One of the questions that I get when I give this talk a lot from people is they go, my community doesn't like fun. <laughs> okay. I don't believe you, but okay. I know that there are people for whom the definition of fun is varied and different. Some people see what I've pitched here today and they think, I know what you're thinking. These aren't fun. Spot, these are torture. I don't want any part of any of your fun. My fun is different. My fun is unique. Every community is going to be unique. They're going to have cultural norms. They're going to have expectations. You, as the person trying to intentionally add fun to your community, are going to know your community better than I do. You're going to be able to look at it objectively and say, these are the things that I see my community do organically for fun. What does this community do? Do they do escape rooms? Do they do crossword puzzles? Do they tell silly jokes to each other? Do they have in-jokes? What can I look at that has happened organically in this community that I can make intentional while not taking away the value of what people were doing organically is not to try and, and, and put it in a nice little Ziploc bag and then sell it to them. It is to create opportunities for that to be a part of the community so people see it happening and they can choose to participate in it and understanding that not everybody will choose to participate in it. We don't make this mandatory fun because mandatory fun very rarely is fun. <laughs> We make it so that people feel comfortable that they have a safe space to choose to do this if they want to, or to just participate in it and watch it. And that's why, again, it was never, a, you have to opt in to get badges. I wanted people to just start getting the badges and hey, if you really don't like this, you can opt out. So a long meandering answer to your long meandering question. <laughs> All right, I don't see any more. So thank you, have fun, enjoy the evening, have fun tonight.